All right, so the session that you're in, in case you're wondering, is called Building Machine Learning Applications in Python. So what are we going to cover today? First, I'm going to do some introductions. I'm Rajat. After that, Yu Cheng's going to take you through data engineering and modeling, uh, an exercise where we'll need that Yelp data set um, that I'm encouraging you all to download. And then afterwards, I'm going to talk about deploying that. So really important, we're pacing this so everyone can follow along. So please, uh, follow, follow along with us. Use your laptop. Interrupt us. Raise your hands if you've got questions or if you're stuck. Um, this way, one of us is speaking. The other one is available to, to make sure that we get you unstuck. So let's introduce ourselves first. I'm Rajat. This is Yu Chang. That's Yu Chang. Um, we, we both work at Dato. Um, we've both been at Dato since the company was formed. Yu Chang's uh, been with the project for quite a while. He's one of the founders of the company. Um, he's our chief architect now, and a lot of his graduate research at CMU is the underpinnings of, of our products at Dato. By the way, uh, we used to be called Graph Lab, um, and I'll, I'll get into that. Also, I should let you know that my background's not machine learning, so all the machine learning questions I'm going to redirect to Yu Chang, um, but I can talk about deployment. So before, uh, before we get, get started into, the, into things, let's get a, a little sense of the room. So how many of you uh, have heard of Dato before? All right. How about Graph Lab? Ooh, more people, yes. So now you all know that we're the same people. Um, how many of you are data scientists or identify yourselves as data scientists? Got one, two, three, four, okay. That's awesome. How about data architects? Ooh, we got one, two, three, ooh, nice. Data engineers, yes. Oh, this is awesome. Pythonistas, oh yeah. And so Yu Cheng mentioned there's another one yesterday. I didn't know about this. Python ears. Does anyone, does anyone identify with that? Um, and what else? There's a bunch of you that didn't raise your hands. So I, I want to hear a little bit about what, uh, what do you guys identify yourselves as? What, what do you do? Say it again. Da, da. Novice. OK. Novice at what? <laughs> Are we saying novice at life? Novice at work? What else? So novice at Python is, I'm, is what I'm guessing. OK, well, that's, we, we're going to go nice and slow with Python. Um, so hopefully, you won't feel that way by the time our session's over. What else? Anybody else? Analytic Acrobat. Analytic Acrobat. I like it. I like it. Can you do any actual like, acrobatic things? OK, well, then, then, then it seems to fit. All right. <laughs> um, so again, interrupt us, raise your hands, let's make this interactive. I know it's late on a Friday and I know I'm stopping you from getting to happy hour or whatever you want to do after this. Um, so, uh, uh, but please, let, let's, uh, let's make this fun. You had your hand raised, what's going on? One more time, uh, I can try. Um, I was going to give you a demo of our company by showing you some product stuff, but fine. We'll go show you the download link. OK. USB key to, to move around? There we go. OK. So let's do a quick demo or two about d what you can build using Dato. I, wanted, I had some slides about our platform and all the products in it. and I was going to show you all that, but that's kind of boring. And I thought it'd be more fun to show you some demos. So this is only going to take a couple minutes. So let's make this big. Can you guys see this? Yeah? So a couple things to say before I get started. Uh, this is a demonstration application. So Dato builds a machine learning platform. We offer a machine learning platform that enables you to build predictive applications. So I want to show you a couple demonstrations of predictive apps you can build. How many of you have seen this demo already? Oh. Oh, only one, fantastic. And that's Brian, so it's totally fine. Um, so what we've built here is a, a very simple front-end application that's deployed on Heroku um, that is a recommendation system. So let's do uh, some, uh, so we built this using the Amazon review data set, which if, it, if you guys are familiar with it, is 34 million uh, reviews. 
uh, from 1996 to 2013 on books, movies, and music. So if we look up a book or a movie, Dumb and Dumber, Dumb and, whoop, Dumb and Dumber, I'll get recommendations for other movies. And like all good demos, it doesn't work the first time. So I'm just, oh, there we go. So what's happening is we get these recommendations. So to do this, we've taken a trained machine learning model and deployed it as a service using data predictive services to a cluster uh, of machines in AWS. And then uh, we're querying that trained model with, with uh, input, in this case, dumb and dumberer. So with Dumb and Dumberer, which I actually haven't seen, um, I'm recommended Hollywood Homicide, Hot Chicks, I think that's right, or The Hot Chick, um, Scary Movie 3, a lot of other stupid comedies. Um, how about another example? You guys have a, a book or an album? I could keep going. No? Oh, that's too new. It's too new. The TV? Oh, the, okay, the album. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if I get Californication. There it is. Oh, I have seasons one through three. I have the show, in fact. Uh, okay. Let's see what I get. Oh, so now, so I'm going to get recommendations for someone that likes Dumb and Dumberer and Californication. So I'm still getting a lot of the same movies, but I'm also getting uh, some One Hot Minute, By the Way, Blood Sugar Sex Magic. These are all albums by Red Hot Chili Peppers, so not too shabby. So this is a really simple recommendation app. You guys have all seen this. You use a lot of products today that, that, ha, that offer you recommendations. Um, and so you can build that sort of system with, with Dato's platform really easily. But let me show you something that, isn't, uh, that you don't get to see all that much, that you can also build using our platform pretty easily. So let's say that I like Dumb and Dumber, not er, Dumb and Dumberer. Oh, Dumb. And there it is, Dumb and Dumber on VHS, good. But my wife wants me to read Sense and Sensibility, the book. So what's it going to take for her to get me from watching Dumb and Dumber to reading Sense and Sensibility? Well, here we see the, the shortest recommended path between the two. So first, she has to watch Dumb and Dumber with me. Then she'll get me to watch Happy Gilmore, which has Adam Sandler. It's also a dumb comedy, but Adam Sandler is a crossover artist. So he does some romantic comedies. That leads you to The Wedding Singer. From that romantic comedy, we get to Clueless, which I don't know if you guys know this or not, but Clueless is a parody of Jane Austen's Emma. So that kind of makes sense that we would move into Jane Austen land, but I'm not ready to read anything yet. So I'm going to watch uh, Emma, an adaptation of the book. Then I'm going to watch another Jane Austen's, uh, another book, another movie based on Jane, uh, Jane Austen book, Mansfield Park. Finally, I'm ready to read something. So I read Mansfield Park, and then I get to Sense and Sensibility. So what makes this interesting is that in order to generate the shortest path, we built a, a graph, an item similarity graph, between, the, between all the items in the data set. And then given a starting and ending point, we found the shortest path between them. So obviously, this is a, a fun example. Um, of going between two products, but you could imagine this is an upsell path or uh, any sort of activity where you're trying to predict getting to a particular goal. What are the shortest steps in between? So a great example of something you can do with machine learning that you know, is a little bit more than just recommending you a new product. So this is the first uh, demo I wanted to show you, and then I wanted to switch to a totally different demonstration app. So let's make this a little smaller. Um, Again, the way this app is architected is we have a three-node uh, cluster running in AWS uh, predict using data predictive services that's hosting a trained machine learning model, uh, a deep learning model or a neural net model that's trained using uh, the GPU for image classification. And then we have this front-end app, which is basically an HTML page and a little JavaScript running on Heroku. And so we take the image and we send it to the predictive service and get back predicted labels. So this model was trained on the ImageNet data set, which is a, a, a well-known data set for object identification. So let's see what predictions we get. So I don't actually, so common newt. Um, so what you're seeing here is you're seeing predictions. 
the predicted label of the item, uh, of the object, and a confidence score. So from the training set, this was a common newt, and so common newt came out on top. Um, that kind of makes sense. Let's try another example. So I've clicked on the image, now we send it to the service. So let's look at the predictions. So black-footed ferret, you can barely see it in the colors, but there's a ferret here. Um, this data set has no humans in it, so there's no uh, human identification or, or person identification. A lot of people ask me, why is there a dog in your logo? Some of you might be asking that. Um, well, this is the answer. This is our founder, Carlos's dog, when the project started uh, back in 2009, and we were called Graph Lab. This is his Labrador. Um, and so when we get predictions, sure enough, Labrador Retriever is the, uh, is the top prediction. So it's, these are all images that we have sort of in, uh, in our app, but why don't we search for something on Getty Images? So what do you guys want to search for that Getty Images would have an image for? Nothing. Say it again. Mantis shrimp? Is that right? I have no idea what this looks like, so it's very cool. All right. So let's hope that Getty Images has, a, has an image of it. Doo -doo -doo. Live demos are so much fun because of this little thing. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Everybody's getting the Yelp data set at this very moment. Which, this is a great time to ask, does anyone need the USB key? Should we pass them around? No, everyone's got the data set. Sweet. I'm going to refresh the app, and we're going to try that again. Um, Mantis Shrimp. Here we go. All right, so which one should I pick? This one. All right. Let's see what we get. Oh, this is pretty fun. I've never seen this one before. Spiny Lobster. I mean, it's not horrible considering uh, it's an under, we're at least in the seafood realm. Um, let's see if we try a different picture, what we get. So every time I'm clicking, we're sending the picture to this, uh, to this model that's hosted as a service, and we're getting back the recommended labels or the predicted labels. Well, that one turned out worse. Um, so here we go, two quick examples of uh, applications that you can build really easily using Dato's platform. So far, so good, guys? Question, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the question was, is this performing deep video indexing or is it using metadata search? This is extracting features from the image itself. So not video, image, um, using the image, but training a, a neural net classifier to extract features from the images themselves. Okay, back to here. All right. Um, and so uh, before we get on to the, to the meat of today's uh, tutorial, we should put a plug in for the other times at PyData that you can come and hear us talk. So tomorrow I'll be talking about uh, scikit-learn models in production, which is uh, a, a talk focused on deployment. And then on Sunday, uh, you guys can get a deep dive into the scalable out-of-core data structure called the S-Frame. Um, Yu Cheng is going to talk about that, which we built specifically for machine learning. All right, so not everybody's participating yet, but hopefully you guys will be. Um, I'm going to step over, Yu Cheng's going to take over, and we're going to do uh, an intro to data science and ML. And remember, raise your hands or interrupt us if you've got questions. Thanks. Oh, don't clap. We haven't even started yet. Don't clap. It's not over. Okay, hi. Hi, hi, hi. Hi. Ah. Okay. Everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. So um, I'm going to do a quick introduction to kind of data science, uh, data science and machine learning. I um, I was told to target this at a rather um, introductory level, and so that's what I have done. So I'm going to explain con interesting concepts with no math whatsoever. So uh, let's see how well, the, how well we do there. Um, so uh, these are links. Uh, if you do not, uh, the key is the, the first data set, uh, PyData Dallas 2015 data.zip, that contains a Yelp data set. So we would like to try to use as much as possible real data. So that is a data set of about 84 megabytes compressed. This is uh, JSON. So JSON has a lot of blank space in it. So 
it unzips to, I think, something about 300 megabytes. And then uh, there's the talks.zip, which contains uh, the PowerPoint slides as well as the IPython notebooks. Uh, that is, I'm going to mainly go through the data engineering IPython notebook. Okay, there are a few other exercises and things which you can get uh, the data from from the from the very last uh, very last link. That exercises is much bigger. It's about 300 megabytes. Contains a subset of Stack Overflow. 300 megabytes of Stack Overflow, and uh, that goes through a number of kind of like um, S frame data engineering exercises. Okay, so. Um, just think about a little about what does a typical kind of data science process looks like. We, you kind of begin with raw data. Your data has come in in uh, various sources, CSV, SQL, and so on. And then the first thing that's really important to do is to try to, is to cut it into two. Before you, uh, if you want to do any kind of learning, any kind of machine learning, you do not want to kind of, uh, you want to get a good, a set of data which you did not train on. Otherwise, you kind of over, uh, you are over, you're overfit on that. You don't get a good sense of how well your data will work in the real, in the real world. So the first is validation split. You get a train set and the validation set. You get to perform machine learning modeling on the training set. You evaluate using the validation set. And then that tells you something about the model. That tells you something about the data. You go back and you tune the data again. Right, and that's kind of essentially the basic outline of what we're going to do here. Data cleaning and exploration, modeling, model interpretation, and result interpretation. So the first key to, mod to data cleaning is to know your tools. There are many data sources. Generally, you need multiple tools. Uh, your data may live on Hadoop, may live on Hive, maybe you may have to access it via SQL, via Spark. Uh, know your tools well, because uh, and, and of course, you will encounter kind of less structured formats like CSVs, and CSVs are annoying uh, because there's no kind of, everyone writes them a little differently, right? Uh, so kind of know your parcel options. Here's a, good, uh, here's a fun question. What's your favorite CSV delimiter? It's called CSV, but people use tabs, people use other stuff. Comma? Yeah, but commas are annoying. You have to escape them and shrinks sometimes. This is a very fascinating one I've encountered once. The byte OXFF or 255. <laughs> this is actually slightly clever because it's actually fully compatible with UTF-8 strings. You do not need to quote it or escape any anyway because OXFF is not actually legal UTF-8. It's kind of entertaining. But <laughs> yes, so... Uh, there are all kinds. Uh, so Panda CSV parser has a huge number of options. Uh, you, uh, kind of, uh, if you ever encounter interesting CSV files, explore them. We, our S frame also has a good number with uh, in, with interesting capabilities, right? Uh, the, another thing which is really important to do is to kind of pay, pay attention to missing values. There can be many, especially when you get data from other sources, from other people, from other teams, they get many representations of missing value. If, it come from, if your data comes from R, NANs are common. The string NA is also common. Python has NANs, and so on and so forth. Right? I've seen, uh, I have had seen data sets in which missing values are represented by negative 999. And that's slightly annoying. <laughs> and kind of like, uh, you want to be able to visualize your data. Uh, uh, understand the visualization tools. Matplotlib is great. Bokeh is great. Uh, and you, you want to be able to just explore the data in whatever way you can. So the key demo which we're going to go through here is to predict whether a Yelp review is funny or not. So here are two reviews. Uh, the left one says, uh, Rosy Dakota and I love Chaparral Dog Park. It's a very convenient and surrounded by lots of paths, a desert, Zeriscape. Baseball fields, ballparks, etc. The right one says the oldish man who owns a store is as sweet as can be, perhaps sweeter than cookies or ice cream. Here's a lowdown: giant ice cream cookie sandwiches for super cheap. The flavor permutations are basically endless, and so on. Which is funny, which is not. <laughs> left or right? A vote. Yeah, so the left is not funny, the right is funny. It's kind of not so easy to tell what uh, what makes something funny or what makes something not funny. And this is kind of what we are going to uh, go through today. So the tools we are going to use here for data exploration is um, really uh, we are going to use kind of a, a pieces of GraphLab Create. So we have this uh, data structure we have is called an S-frame. 
you can think about it as something like a pandas data frame. It has a it has very similar looking functions. API is slightly different, but it's substantially more scalable. We, sc uh, we scale to disk, we scale to SSD, we go, uh, we, we go out of core. The internal backend storage is a heavily optimized column, uh, compressed column store. Uh, S-Frames itself is, will soon be part of an open source package. Uh, it's technically open source now, but you can't really, it's not so easy to, put, to make a PyPy or Conda package out of it, but we are working, we are refactoring it to make it an actual uh, Python package. And we also have Canvas, which is a data visualization tool, which is part of GraphLab Create. Okay, so I discovered this fascinating plugin to Jupyter recently. So forgive the swooshing. <laughs> okay, we're going, so we're going to do visualization. So the first thing is um, we're going to use matplotlib in various places. So we're going to import matplotlib. Ooh. Yes. Ooh. OK. Let's try that. Better. Swoosh. <laughs> OK, it's an import graph lab. OK, so the first thing we have is a CSV is a, a CSV parser, okay? We have a re-CSV, it is as fast if not faster than a Panda CSV parser, but it has some more fast, uh, really fascinating uh, type inference capabilities. So for instance, we're gonna take, look at the Yelp data set. The Yelp data set is a, is a JSON file, okay? So each line is a JSON string, business ID and so on and so forth. Each line is a JSON string. Now, you can, we can think about this as a CSV file of one column where each column, uh, where each row contains a dictionary. And we can parse that. So we infer that the column type is a dictionary. And now we can look at it. So this is the business S frame. And its type is dictionary. We can slice it. We can pull out the first, uh, uh, any, any, any arbitrary value. We can arbitrarily slice it, range 20 to 40, and so, so forth, so on and so forth. OK? Now, one of our uh, interesting capabilities is the ability to unpack a column. So we can, we're going to unpack the column x1, and that pulls apart the contents of the, uh, that pulls apart the contents of the dictionary. And now we end up with a big table, which is all the information, business ID, category, city, address, latitude, and so on and so forth. We have some built-in data exploration capabilities. We can run this dot show. And that gives you a quick visualization of all the data. So business ID categories with one glance, as you can see, restaurants are the most common category on the, uh, uh, in the entire table. City, address, latitude, longitude, name, and so on. So a uh, subway is the most common restaurant, and yeah. So a lot of these statistics are done kind of with one pass. That one pass. So uh, kind of like the number of unique values is an estimate. So all these are done by one pass catching algorithms. So we can run them on very large data sets very efficiently. So we can also look at the table view, and you get to see. I tell you, Excel is a very powerful tool. <laughs> so the ability to just quickly scan through all the data. So this, this works even if the data set is really big. What happens is that we, uh, as you scroll, we page in different sets, uh, uh, different rows of the table. OK. So next, we're going to load the review data. The review data looks similar. Um, takes a, so with the new version of IPython notebook, the uh, incremental printing seems to have stopped working, but that's fine. So it's kind of, it looks the same. It's just one big JSON glob. Uh, we can, we'll just unpack it directly since we know what it is. And the reviews, so it just looks like this. We have a business column. We have a date column, review ID, stars, text, and so on and so forth. Right, and what and you see find that um, okay. Essentially, we uh, 
So this is one row of the S-frame. Business ID date, we can look at the D type. So the uh, S-frames are strongly typed. So uh, each column must be one of type string, integer, float, diction, uh, we support dictionary and list, which are arbitrary recursive. So that allows us to hold arbitrary JSON, uh, JSON information with inside uh, one cell. And as well as an image type, which, um, which we use for kind of the deep learning applications. Now, so one thing we see is that votes is still a dictionary. That's a dict there. If I look at review zero, votes. This guy said dictionary. So votes as cool, funny, and useful. So we're going to do funny predictions. So we do need the funny, uh, the, the funny column. So we further unpack the funny, the votes column. And now we have. Okay, there. Now we have cool, funny, and useful. Okay. So now, so we the the whole table is called an S frame, but then. Uh, what, what makes this uh, different from some of the other scalable data frame data structures out there is that it doesn't quite just express a table on this. It's not a, exactly, it's not a SQL uh, wrapper or some sort. Really, it be, uh, the, S, the S frame looks like a data frame, and they have a column type called the S array, which looks like a NumPy array. So for instance, here, we can pull out one column, funny votes. Okay, that's the total number of funny votes. So funny votes here is an S array. And we can take kind of the, the, fun, the funny column, the cool column, and useful column, add them together, and assign that, and create a new column in reviews called total votes. And if we look at reviews now, uh, expand, contract. OK, there we go. There's a new column in there, total votes. Because we, can, we maintain our own materialization format, so we are, we are actually creating these columns in memory on, on this. We, uh, we will use memory until we have to go to this. There's an there's a caching, there's an extensive caching layer in place. OK. Now, I'm going to go back to slides. Ooh. Why is rated? Where are my slides? Okay. okay. So we're going to look at uh, PCA here as of the first tool. Here we're going to uh, use scikit-learn. Okay. Now, mathematically, they say a PCA basically finds the principal eigenvectors of the data covariance matrix. Now, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> so uh, let's do it once more. S somewhat into it, um, uh, somewhat more intuitively. First, I'm going to normalize the data, so the center of all the data, the mean of all the data, is at zero zero. We're going to find a line passing through the center, so that the average distance of every data point is minimized. Ooh, there we go. This is the first principal component. That's it. To get a second principal component, we find a second line which are right angles to the first line, so that the average distance to every data point to the line is minimized. And that's a second principal component. To get a third principal component, you find a, a line that's at right angles to all the previous lines, and so the average distance to it, every data point is minimized again. Now, obviously there's no more such lines, because this data is two dimensions. So this is kind of first, the, there can be only be as many principal components as there are dimensionality of the data. Okay, so let's take a quick demo. Okay, so we're gonna use Matplotlib and scikit-learn here. Okay, so we're gonna import, scikit uh, import PCA from scikit-learn. Okay. Now, we're gonna just look at funny, cool, and useful, these three columns, convert that to a, data, convert that to a pandas data frame. So that converts from S frame to pandas data frame. I'm going to slice out three columns, funny, cool, and useful. I'm going to run PCA on that. So PCA create us for three components and I'm going to uh, fit, perform a fit on the data. It runs quickly. And uh, this, are the, this is the output, which are collection of numbers. Now, let's see if we can plot this thing. 
okay? Some matplotlib incantations. <laughs> so, uh, you can take a closer look at you if you want, but this is what the data looks like. Okay, so here are all the data points. There's a blue dots. The red line is a principal component. This is the main line in which most of the variation of the data occurs, uh, uh, occurs in. And then there are also two other lines which are hard to see. There's a green line and there's a blue line here, which are kind of the, the re two, two remaining axes of the data. Okay, now, what can we do with it? Now, really the objective here we want is to be able to try to interpret this thing, right? What, what does this actually mean, right? Okay, let's do a slightly bigger fit. We're going to fit funny, cool, useful N stars, okay? And we're going to run PCA on this. Okay, now, let's see how far I can zoom in there. So, we just get numbers here, but essentially, they are in the order funny, cool, useful, and stars, okay? Now, we have weights here. There's a first principal component has weight 77%, right? And, uh, and these are components for funny, cool, useful, and stars. What this means is that the, prince, the primary component says that most of the variation of data can be explained by reviews which are, both, which are all funny, cool, and useful, but has absolutely nothing to do with stars. So in other words, most of the time, uh, most of the time Funny, cool, and useful are kind of correlated with each other, but the amount of those votes do not tell you anything about the stars. Okay? The uh, I would like to get the second component. How do I do that? Okay. All right. Uh, the second component, if you look at values, essentially it explains that 11% of the variation of data says that funny reviews are anti-correlated with cool and also anti-correlated with stars. There's something... Uh, I really want to get the values. One second. Okay, fine. Yeah, so... Uh, but kind of by, just by looking at the weights of the components, that tells you uh, a lot of information about, uh, that can, gives you some information about uh, what the data sort of looks like, what are the common, common patterns you see with the data set. But we can do, But we can do a we we can uh, but there's still there's more more capabilities uh, to for PCA right so this is kind of a quick summary the way of component says how strongly the data varies along the component and component is sorted by weight but what PCA also gets you is damage sanity reduction right and this is one of the most important aspects of PCA um, so. Normally, what I'm going to do is I get the number of components is much smaller than the number of dimensions in the data. So for instance, here I have a two-dimensional data, so maybe I just pick one dimension. Okay? How do I achieve dimension reduction? Dimension is essentially my data is begins at a much higher dimension. I'm going to try to bring it down to something much smaller. Right? Maybe I'm going to use it in some other applications. I'm going to use it in other machine learning applications. I'm going to use it for visualization and so on. Okay? Now, to do this, we project each data point onto the set of components. And really, we are only going to maintain the distances along each component, along each component direction, right? And you see what this really is, this value is the inner product between the data point and the component vector. Right, and what this really does is we're going to project and we're going to rotate the data. So now, now this is, I only have one x-axis here, and my data point only lives along this x-axis. Okay. Now, where is this used? What is a one, one of the most common applications of this is something called eigenfaces. In eigenfaces, what happens is that each axis is a pixel. So I have as many axes as I, as I have the size of the image. Each data point is a face image. So my data has number of pixel width times the number of pixel height, worth of dimensions, and, my num and I'm going to select a number of components which is much, much smaller than the number of pixels, maybe 20. Right, and you end up with faces uh, with uh, components which look like that. 
right? And this is one of the simplest uh, face recognition methods. What, you, what happens is you take, you take faces, you project the faces onto, comp onto these components, and you compute, uh, you, which are now much smaller. You're not looking at uh, maybe 128 by 120 pixels. I'm only looking at a shorter vector of maybe 100, maybe 100 new, uh, double values, right? I'm going to compute new, uh, nearest neighbor within this component, sp component space. Right, and this is called eigenfaces, and uh, I think it's 19, uh, 1987, and one of the first re uh, really effective face recognition models. Okay, but so next we're going to look at about, about actually get to solving that uh, funny problem. Okay, next is again modeling. Machine learning is all about modeling. What is a model? A model is an actual. Uh, Actually, we had this really fascinating uh, debate in the office once about what defines a model, right? Uh, the physicists have a different understanding of what a model is. Machine learning have a different understanding of what a model is. But essentially, a model is an extremely simplified view of the data, right? And the key is that all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? Now, one of the most common models, uh, one of the simplest yet most powerful things are linear classifiers. And this is what I'm going to do here, logistic regression. What logistic regression is, it does to, uh, binary classification. There are generalizations to do multi multiple classes, but let's just talk about binary classification, right? And so here's an example. I have two reviews here, one funny and one, and not. one is not. They have different numbers. Uh, one has one star and usefulness uh, score of four. The other has five stars and usefulness score of two, okay? What is my model? Say I run logistic regression on it, and we end up with a model that looks like that. We have a constant value. There's always a constant value. We have stars as weight negative 3 and useful weight 1. Now, what makes logistic regression a linear model is, OK, how do I classify, for the, say, the first data point? I take the constant value. I add it to stars 1 times negative 3, which is the weight. I take useful 4, multiply it by the weight 1, and I look at the output. So that's greater than 0, so that's funny. That's, one, that's the positive class. Substituting the values for a second gives me something which is less than 0, and this is a negative class, and it's not funny. That's it. That's logistic regression. Uh, that's, a, that's linear modeling, right? Logistic regression defines a, uh, 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 as well as support vector machines and a whole, a whole, a very, very large collection of models all fall under this basic class. The key difference is how much do you weigh examples which are um, which are almost wrong or uh, which are wrong, which are just wrong. How much, how much do you weigh examples which are classified incorrect by the model? How much do you penalize them in different ways? And uh, that they call, uh, there's a loss function. And the difference between all the linear models is simply kind of the, the choice of loss function. Right. And so what do I do if I get categorical variables? For instance, day of the month, or maybe this review contains the word bread. Right. So what happens is that I'm expanding my, I'm expanding my data quite a lot, right? So uh, every every data point will have a value for uh, day equals one, day equals two, day equals three, and it's zero if it's not true, and if one if it's true, right? It's going to generate one feature per category, and now this can get uh, uh, this would become a very very big, uh, very large data set, and normally it's represented sparsely. So I only store the ones. So that's normally represented as a sparse matrix, right? So um, now. What we're going to do here really is going to use uh, Graph Lab Create for some of the machine learning pieces, for the actual learning. Why? Because most machine packages require to kind of carefully transform the input into appropriate shapes. Like, for instance, you have to transform the sparse matrix to feed it in, right? This can make later interpretation quite difficult, uh, especially if I want to reverse it, reverse the process. I'm going to take the coefficients, I'm going to reverse it, and figure, figure, out, what, figure out what they mean. I have those, I have to uh, work on the, the pipeline to actually get the data in, right? So uh, what, 
our toolkits, the basic idea is that we take the SRMs directly as input. You give us shrinks, you give us dictionaries, you give us sparse or dense data, we try to do something sensible with it. So strings are automatically interpreted as categories, and the co output coefficients will reflect that, will ref uh, are interpretable. Dictionaries can interpret as sparse vectors, and the, output, and the result coefficients are interpretable. And uh, there's a, the other key is that uh, we designed it, because the S-frames go out of core, Right, we can hold hundreds of gigabytes on a uh, on, on on a laptop essentially, and uh, so uh, all the algorithms are built to to use out of the core data, right? And uh, they're very robust and automatic solver selections and so on, right? And so this is the key part, the demo with using the Yelp data set to predict whether a review is funny or not. Sounds good. So, predicting funniness. Okay, first thing that we will see is that really many, many things have no votes. Many of the reviews have no votes whatsoever, right? Not, uh, not, funny, not, re uh, not funny, not useful, nor cool, right? And we're going to throw that away, right? And what I'm going to do is uh, reviews, square bracket, reviews of total votes. This is what we call a logical filter. Right, and what's a logical filter? A logical filter, it, it selects all rows for which the inner predicate, the corresponding row in the inner predicate says none empty, or none zero, right? So we can do more interesting stuff like reviews, give me all reviews which are where the funny vote is less than 10, and all the useful votes are greater than five, for instance, right? And um, we, can, we can run that, and it should give us some output. Okay, right, and uh, so a lot, uh, a lot of what we do is lazy evaluated. So for instance, you will see here, we do not actually know the number of rows. Uh, you can materialize it later when, if you want to. Right, so we're going to do classification of funny, right? So the first thing we're going to do is that reviews with at least one vote for funny are funny. So here we're going to binarize it. So reviews funny equals to reviews funny greater than zero. So that just binarizes, binarizes the data, leaving us with funny of all just zeros or ones. Okay. So the, the data is integer, but the contents are all zeros or ones. So we, uh, we compress it very efficiently back end, so you don't have to worry about that, hey, it takes up 64 bits. No, it will end up taking up one bit. So the first thing we do always is, okay, let's make a train validation split. Train validation equal reviews or random split, split at 0 0.9, so 90% of our stuff are going to the training data, and 10% uh, will go into the validation set. Okay, now let's actually do something. The first thing you ever always do is let's get a baseline, right? Without baseline, there is, uh, you do not know if what you do is actually making an improvement at all, right? So uh, here, we're going to count the number of uh, funny votes, uh, the count the number of uh, things which are not funny and kind of a number of things which are funny in the validation set. And the first thing is, okay, 53.76% of things are not funny. So if I just predict everything is not funny, that gives us 53.8% accuracy. Okay, so the objective is now to do better than this. Okay, now, uh, so you will see this in the notebook as well. Uh, to, uh, I try to make it so that every section is executable on its own. So uh, everyone will repeat this function, kind of select features over and over again, but just get, the, get bigger and bigger. I will add as we add more and more features into the model. Right? So the first is, okay, let's add, the, let's try to predict funny from stars. So we're going to just select features, we're going to just select the stars column and the funny column because we actually need that to train. Uh, perform a select features from uh, to, to get the, uh, the modified train and validation split, and we do logistic classifier create train, run right on train data. We are going to classify the funny column, and we tell it the validation set. Okay, this runs. 
well, in, instantly we do we do uh, we do an uh, we do automatic solver selection and background. So uh, because this is really small, we end up just using Newton method and converges uh, really really quickly. Okay. So one thing we can look at immediately is the coefficients. So stars. The intercept is 0 0.34. Stars negative weighted. That means that stars uh, predicts funny. It's anti correlated funny essentially. Um, the higher the, the higher the stars, the number of stars, the less funny it is. Or the funny funny things have low stars, right? Stars are negative correlated funny before. You uh, this actually has been observed elsewhere before. Okay. We can add date time as a feature. This takes a little bit more work, but essentially the first thing we're going to do here is that we're going to take the date column and interpret it as a date time type. So we have a column type which is called date time, right? And we can split it up into a year, month, day. We cut it up, we cut up the date time components in the year, month, day, and interpret it as strings. Because the, the no, normal interpretation is that as integers will mean that um, will mean that the weight gets multiplied by the value of the month, which is like 12 or 1, and you do not want that. You want the, the, you want the year, you want the month, you want the day to be interpreted kind of categorically, right? And so uh, what I do here is simple. You interpret it as a string, right? You convert it to a string, and we just run it as normal. Okay? Once again, that runs quickly, and we can look at coefficients. So the end of the year is funniest. <laughs> okay? People write funny reviews towards the end of the year. Uh, December, uh, uh, date month, December, November, October, all are positive correlated with funny. Okay, that's interesting, but let's see how far we can go. But, uh, oh yeah, also, you see now that our uh, validation accuracy is now about 60%. Oh, it kind of got truncated. Oh, no, it's a rollover to the other side. So 60, 0 0.6, 0 0.6071, so about 60%. So that's an improvement from the baseline of about 53.8%, right? Okay, slight improvement. Let's go further. Let's see how far we can go. We're going to add business categories as a feature, right? So maybe certain business categories are more, um, are funnier than others, okay? And this... Uh, Actually, gets quite entertaining. So, business. First, the business uh, S frame has business ID and categories in it. Okay, the categories are like accountant, professional services. It's, it's a list. It's a list of stuff, right? Now, what we're gonna do is that we want to join it against the reviews frame. Okay, but then we also want to interpret the categorical categories as a sparse vector, right? So we wanted to go. Uh, so this business has uh, music and DVDs that has value one. Books has value one. Magazines has value one. And then everything else is zero, and we don't care about it. Right? So this kind of automatically interprets it uh, sparsely. So the first thing is, OK, we're going to use a uh, take business category and use a lambda. You apply a lambda expression, essentially, to convert it to kind of our every element, key, colon, one. Right? So for uh, the least element has value one. So if we run this, oh, okay. You see now categories is now accountants colon one, bikes colon one, shopping colon one, and so on. Right. Okay. And then to make it to join it back against uh, the uh, my. Uh, next time, we're just going to join it back against my review information, right? So here is kind of the business categories. We are just join it back against business to get categories, and uh, so we take the we take the reviews as frame. We join it against business ID and categories, right? So I think just business ID and categories. We don't care about all the remaining fields. We join it on the field business ID, and the left join. Okay. We run this. This is a little bit longer, because, partly due to lazy evaluation. Uh, and now our accuracy, validation accuracy, goes up sixty-one percent. So validation accuracy is about sixty-one point six percent. Training accuracy is about sixty-one point seven percent. Okay. So that's still fine. Uh, let's look at how well we do. Uh, let's, let's look at the coefficients. Okay. Ah. Uh, There we go. 
the funniest categories uh, is uh, personal injury law and public relations, <laughs> as well as laboratory testing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, adult entertainment is somewhere there. Uh, <laughs> the uh, least funniest categories are session photography and shaved ice and shared office spaces, recording studios, neurologists, uh, aqua aqu aquariums, Argentine. I don't know what, why is the, what is the business category of Argentine. Okay, yeah. So yeah, this kind of yeah just. Um, uh, model interpretation, right? Now, last thing we're going to do here uh, is going to add text as a feature, okay? So here it's simple. Uh, everything is the same. What we're going to do is that we are just going to take the text of the review, pass it through one of the uh, simple, simple utility libraries we have in the textanalytics.count words, right? And that just takes for the text, just uh, extracts, uh, takes, uh, uh, returns a dictionary, which is for each word, how many times did it occur, and so on. Okay, uh, this is a little longer to run, uh, probably about 30, uh, 20, 20, 30 seconds or so. I'm not going to wait for it, but uh, here, this is what the output looks like. Okay, uh, now, this is interesting. So, our training accuracy went up to about 82%. Our validation accuracy is only about 63%, right? This starts to the smell of essentially overfitting. So, the reason is there are now because now you have one coefficient for every word, right? So we have only about 130,000 examples, but we have 98,000, 99,000 coefficients, right? And so that's kind of overfitting. Essentially, what happens is that your model is becoming really, really good at predicting the training data, but not so good at predicting things which are outside of the training data. Right, so... Uh, we can, uh, uh, a lot of these can be tuned very carefully. You can tune the regularization, you can tune other stuff. But the alternative is, let's just trim out some words, okay? So we can reduce the number of coefficients by kind of throwing away some useless, useless features. Now, you, have heard of, you may have heard of TF-IDF, you may have heard of stop word removal. These are, things that, these are things we have. But then we're going to just do something, uh, something simpler, which is we got, it's a one-hot encoder. Essentially, all, we, all it does is that we interpret uh, a week. We take, um, we take the text, we take a text column, and we drop all, categor all categorical variables which occur infrequently, leaving only the top 5,000. Right? So, well, the one hacker normally, uh, really what it does is that it, it, uh, it takes, um, it takes category of, it takes a column of like, categories, right? And it splits it up into an array. So there's one one in the array. Essentially, exactly what we did earlier to get uh, to get a sparse array, to get a sparse matrix from categorical input. It does exactly that. But then what we can do as well is that uh, this has a capability of dropping uh, uh, dropping infrequent features, right? And um, we can see what it does. So with Aha, uh -huh. I didn't run something earlier. Okay, but essentially, this is a kind of a nice presentation software, but the problem is it's hard to go back and forth. But essentially what, happened, what it does is that it adds a column called encoded features, which are now just, um, ju uh, just a dictionary of numeric IDs. Numeric IDs to value, numeric IDs to value. Okay, um, you, can, you, can run, you can run this on, on your notebook. And we can train the classifier based on that. So now we have much fewer coefficients. There's only 5,000 uh, 5, coefficients, 130,000 examples. That's good. And we look through the end, training accuracy, 68%. Validation accuracy, 66%. Okay? So that's good. So now we have gone from about 53% accuracy from the SR baseline up to now about 66%. Okay? Since the encoder performs some remapping, it remaps things to numeric categories, it takes a little more with the actual coefficients, but then we get that these are the words most predictive of not funny. Rental, 2011, Groupon, Chai, right? Uh, but then what are interesting are the things which are most 
predictive or funny. I'm not going to run this because it's being recorded. You can look at it yourself. Uh, essentially, the words most predictive or funny are all swear words. <laughs> yeah. So the last thing we can do now is we can add user ID as a feature. What this essentially achieves is personalization. So the idea is, you know, some users are funnier than others, right? So uh, very simple, we just kind of just add user ID to the selection here, right? And then we end up with 72% validation accuracy. Okay, so this is our final. So essentially we went from 53% 50, uh, all the way up to 70%, gradually adding one feature at a time, right? Finally, personalization adds, adds a most, as a most boost to our accuracy. Just for fun, what happens if I try to just predict whether review is funny or not just from the user ID? We now have 70%, right? So just user ID alone gives us 70% accuracy, okay? What does that mean? Why? Okay. Why? Any thoughts? Okay, so is there some reviewers, some, some reviewers are inherently, some people are inherently funnier than others. Is there some people inherently post funny reviews than others. Okay, that's one. Funny people write funny reviews. Okay, and another possibility there's a strong correlation between person and vocab choice. So text and user ID may practically, may, may overlap significantly. However, there's another way to think about this. This is something which um, is really important to think about when doing feature engineering, which is your choice of features may have performance implications beyond your metric of choice, which is in this case is how accurate the prediction is, right? So if we look at per review accuracy, sorry, this should be 72% here. Uh, so if we look at uh, just on per review accuracy, user ID alone gets 72%. Adding all features with user ID gives me 72%. Okay? But if I look at accuracy per reviewer, kind of like group it together uh, and look at just uh, accurate, uh, aggregated accuracy per reviewer, we get a much bigger difference here, 67% versus almost 70%. Right? And this is a quick plot, a plot of what is the accuracy gained by using all the features for reviewers with less than a certain number of reviews. That's hard to read. but what this means is, okay, for reviewers with, less, with uh, less than 10 reviews over here, by adding uh, all, by having all the features, we get a much bigger boost in accuracy, right? This makes a lot of sense because for reviewers with, no, uh, uh, reviewers which um, have only one review, for instance, right? We have only made one review. You have no, very little information about how funny the person is, right? And that, and so, um, adding all the remaining features gives us a large boost in accuracy, right? And so this is the last key, last thing, which is essentially go, uh, going beyond, a little beyond just the metric which you are looking at, which uh, when doing feature engineering. Kind of know your true, uh, true uh, real objectives. Getting high accuracy alone is not enough. You need to know something about how the model is intended to be used. For instance, in this case, the reality is probably you, uh, is, is Yelp, pro very likely you have a lot, a lot of real users with only one or two reviews. And therefore, a model which uses an ID alone, user ID alone for prediction, will necessarily do very poorly on all these users. Right? So this is in part a question of uh, your data set. Where do you get your data set from? How do you, how do you obtain your data set? It's also a question of data set cleaning, because when doing training, when doing model training, Frequently, you want to 
you may want to throw away some of these users because they tell you so little information. There is, it's better not to have them at all when doing the training in the first place. But then that also biases you. Uh, uh, that also biases your model in some cases, especially when you're doing feature engineering. So this is something to uh, you want to constantly keep in mind of your. Uh, your a, a simple accuracy score may not be fully predictive of how it is going to be like in the real world, which is why kind of A-B testing is important too. Right. So um, that's essentially all I have. Uh, so uh, come to my S-Frame talk on Sunday at 10 a.m. And we, uh, we'll uh, talk about how we make S-Frame and S-Graph scale to essentially a terabytes of data on a single machine. Right. And then now Rajat will come and give us a t uh, talk on how do we deploy this thing into production. Thanks, Yucheng. Yeah. Yeah. So who's still, uh, who's, who's having trouble with GraphLab Create? Oh, my laptop, yes. Show of hands, who's, all right, thank you for sticking with us for this long. Um, so Yucheng, if you can uh, help some folks out. So a couple things. Um, so I forgot to mention this up front, I should have. We're a Python package, uh, Python 2. Um, so folks running Python 3, I apologize. We don't have anything for you yet. Um, uh, so yes, uh, so keep an eye out for Yu Chang. And as you see him sort of bounce up, uh, raise your hand or interrupt me. Um, definitely want to make sure everybody's running GraphLab Create before today's over. Um, OK. I already showed you that. So you guys, uh, so Yu Cheng just walked through how to, how to train a, a machine learning model using this Yelp data set. So I'm not going to go through all of that. Um, but just to set some context here, um, I'm running, let's see, can I go full screen? Is this going to do the right thing? All right. Um, uh, I'm running GraphLab Create version 1.3. This is a, an IPython notebook. Um, and I've gone through the same basic steps that, that Yu Cheng went through. So you can see uh, I looked, um, I loaded the same data set that you guys all have. Uh, so what I'm going to cover for, for this last part of the tutorial, you guys are almost there, uh, almost at the end of the first day, is how do you deploy this model as a service now? And go ahead, do you have a question? Aha, sorry, good, good question. So this is, uh, this is called Data Engineering Deployment is the name of the notebook. You should see it. Oh, no. Um, interesting. So are you running IPython notebook or Jupyter? Aha. So, the, so I think I may have understood what the issue was that someone else was having, too. Um, I wrote this notebook, uh, and we wrote these notebooks using Jupyter, so the latest version of IPython notebook. Um, so it uses a new format or a new version of the format. So I don't think it'll work with IPython Notebook. But um, shoot me an email, and I'll send you an old, uh, like a, a translated version for IPython Notebook, um, the, the previous version. How many people are stuck with that? Uh -huh. It tanked IPython. Well, I did not think it had that much power. No, 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 we can work around it today. <laughs> yeah, so, what, so the, the issue that Yu Chang uh, uh, went through really fast there is um, the latest version of Anaconda depends on a very recent version of the Tornado web server, which uh, GraphLab Create also depends on, but we depend on an older version of it. Um, and we're both kind of stuck in uh, Python package uh, immaturity. All the things that Conda solves for you, but since we don't have a Conda package yet, you can't take advantage of. Um, so uh, the workaround is, if you're stuck when you tried to pip install GraphLab Create and saw an error that uh, in incorrect version of Tornado, the workaround is to, to install the, the specific command. And I'll write it up here just so that everybody can see it. Um, we'll do it right here. Um, it's pip install Tornado equals equals 4.1. So we're basically going to force pip to install this version of Tornado, and then GraphLab Create should be fine. Now, if GraphLab Create's not fine, then the workaround that'll work is you first uninstall GraphLab Create, 
This is going to sound amazing, guys. You're going to love this. Um, then you uninstall Tornado. Then you install GraphLab Create. And then you install this version of Tornado. Because GraphLab Create depends on an older um, version of Tornado. So there's this uh, chicken and egg sort of problem. Um, OK, remember to keep, uh, uh, keep interrupting me with questions. Um, the goal of this session is to show how easy it is to kind of take what we've built so far, what we've trained so far, and make it consumable by others. So to deploy it into a, a production-like environment. OK? All right, so, um, so this is very similar to what Yu Chang did. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, I'm doing the same sort of operations on that S frame. Um, and I'm creating, a, we're going to do a classification if something is funny or not. So it's exactly the same thing that happened before. Um, and so we're actually going to get to the model training step. And the one difference is that I'm training only on the text features. And Yu Chang talked about that. Um, but the way that I've trained this model is only on the text features using the logistic regression uh, model. Um, so right now, I've gotten a model. Um, and let's, uh, I can show you. So this is my trained model. Um, you guys can follow along using the, the data engineering deployment notebook. Um, there's subtle differences in this one, which is why this one's called data engineering deployment live, because it's got my AWS credentials in it, and I didn't want to give those to you. Um, so, uh, and that's what we're going to do next. The next thing we want to do is deploy this model as a service to a cluster of machines in AWS, and then query that service. So we're going to do that together. So far, so good? No one has interrupted me yet. All right, OK, that's fine. I'll take your smiles instead of your questions. Um, so first things first, let's write the function or the service API. So we're, we're deploying this model as a service. So let's decide how we want that service to respond. What's the interface for the web service? So in the old days, this might be a WSDL document if we were going to write awful web services with XML and just awfulness. Um, but now it can be a lot simpler. We're, we're communicating using JSON, and we're just writing a Python function. So here we go. We've, written, we've got a function. We're going to call it the funny predictor function. It takes in text, so any string. We're going to take that text. We're going to do the same feature engineering or feature selection that we did when we trained the, the, the machine learning model. And then we're going to call that same model, that same model that you guys trained, that we were just looking at here. Um, we're going to, to transform the data. Uh, after we selected the features out of the data, we're going to transform the data and call the classify method to get back a classification about whether we predict that this text is funny or not. So what you can imagine is we've taken this train model, and now we want to deploy it as a service. So what are, what's the action? What are the, what's the thing we're trying to do? We want to send in a review as a string of text and, and have the model return funny or not, right? So this is our function. Instead of just returning if the class is, is equal to 0, then we're going to say it's not funny. I thought we should add a funny column. So that way we get back something that's uh, a little bit more human readable. So I'm going to run this. And now I'm going to try funny predictor, just this function that's sitting in my IPython notebook. Uh, damn, this is good. So from the model we trained, we got back the prediction with 52, 53% probability that damn, this is good is funny. What do you guys think? OK? So now we've got the function. So now let's, let's, do the, let's set up the cluster. Let's set up the deployment. Let's set up the, the, the predictive service. So you set up your AWS credentials. These are not my AWS credentials. But mine are already in my session. And then to use, uh, to use EC2 as our environment, we need to set up a little bit of configuration. And this doesn't render really well. Let's see if I can. Can you guys still read that? That looks so much better. Can you guys read that? Is that OK? So what we're, what we're doing, and I'm up here, what we're doing here is we need to set up some configuration parameters for how we want to use EC2. Um, and if you've done a lot of stuff in AWS like I have, this gets kind of annoying to have to specify the instance type, the region, over and over again, your credentials, where you want to store logs. So we have this uh, convenience object that we call the environment. Um, and so we instantiate one of those. We give it a name so that way we can refer to it. Uh-oh, can't double click. 
an IPython notebook. Um, so we give it a name. We, we indicate where in S3 we want to store logs. For anything we're doing in EC2, we want the logs to go to some durable place. The instances go away. We lose the logs. So we, pa we, we provide a place in S3 for the logs. What region? We're going to launch this in Oregon. Um, what instance type? So M3 X large, pretty standard. And then for a clustered environment, the number of nodes. So that's what num hosts is. So I want a three node cluster. Um, feel free to make this as big as you want, um, but you're going to pay for those instances. So um, keep that in mind. For this example, you don't need a three node cluster. One node is just, just fine. Um, so I've already got this environment. Uh, I've already created it. So I'm just going to load it. And see, I'm loading it using the, uh, if you guys remember from earlier today, the get adder, um, or if, you if you've used that in Python before. So I'm referring to it by its logical name, and I'm printing it out. And you can see, uh-oh, I am leaking my access key to you guys. Okay, good. Um, if you want to see all the environments I have, uh, you can do that too. It's just graphlab.deploy.environments. So one of the things that um, makes this a little bit different than a typical Python package that you might be familiar with is that there's parts of it that maintain state. Um, so the environment objects are one of those. The predictive service objects that I'm going to show you next is another one. And you want to think about this. What we do is we write something into your home directory. Um, and this is where we sort of maintain a workbench. Because you don't want to have to type this in every time. You don't want to have, uh, you just want to be able to refer to your EC2 environment logically. Um, and the same with something that you're doing in EC2, like you create a predictive service deployment, which is a cluster of machines. That's always on. So you don't want to have to uh, remember the code to load it over and over again. You should just be able to squirrel that away and then load it back. And that's what the, the graphlab.deploy.environments or predictive services uh, uh, objects will show you. So, so far, so good. We've just set up this metadata object about uh, how we want to use EC2. So the next step is to actually launch the cluster. So that's what this code does. So I'll go through this API. It's one API call, graphlab.deploy.predictiveService.create. We're going to give it a logical name. Yelp. Yelp funny, and logical name means this is how, where, how it's going to be stored on my, in my home directory on my laptop, so that I can logically refer to this cluster. I can close my laptop, go home, open it later, um, and logically load up the cluster if I want to look at it. Then I want to pass in the EC2 environment. This is the configuration for EC2 that I want to use. So that's this object that we instantiated earlier. And then where do I want to keep, this, this last line is really important. For predictive services, it's a cluster of machines. So we want to keep all the metadata about that cluster not trapped on my laptop, but someplace in S3. This way, if my laptop gets run over by a bus, I haven't lost all pointers to my cluster. I can still go and load that uh, from another machine. And the other reason this is important is this is the standard, uh, sort of this, the best practice for how teams work together with one cluster. One person sets up the cluster, and then all they have to share is this path. And then uh, email that to, to the other team member. The other team member can then load that predictive service, assuming you guys have credentials that all fall into one parent account, or you, get, you guys share credentials, however you want to do that. Um, as long as you can access that location in S3, you can then load the predictive service to take administrative actions on it, like deploying a new model to it, scaling it up from uh, one, two nodes, three nodes, to eight nodes, um, or shutting it down. Obviously, there's other operations, but you get the gist. Does this make sense? It's one line to launch a cluster. Now, if we actually waited for that to happen, uh, it would take like 15 minutes. So I'm just going to do what I just described, where I'm going to load an existing deployment. So this is one of our demo clusters. So it's one command, gl.deploy.predictiveService.load. Notice how this one's .create, this one's .load. And I'm just passing in this one path in S3, which is where the, the state of that predictive service is captured. And then I'm going to print it out so that you can see. So what you guys see here is uh, this is the, the logical name for this predictive service. It's called demo lab dash scikit. Um, this is the path that we just used, the state path. There's no description because I didn't feel like writing one. This is the API key. This is an important, uh, important key that this is what you need to make any queries uh, against this predictive service. So it's not open to the world. You've got to pass the API key in when an application is querying it. There's also an authentication key, which we don't uh, visibly show, but is also configurable. Um, and that, uh, 
that is how you need an authentication key in order to make administrative changes. Like, uh, so actually, sorry, it's called an admin key. API key is for requests. Um, admin key is for doing things like add a node, remove a node from the cluster. So administrative operations are with one key, and data plane or query operations requests are using a different key. Both of these are configurable. For this demo, I've, uh, uh, I'm not using SSL, but you can obviously set up uh, an SSL certificate and make sure all your traffic is over SSL as well. So far, so good. Since this is running over normal HTTP, I'm not setting a core's origin. I'm not querying it using JavaScript where I want to set up which domains, but you can do all of that as well. And uh, I'll go into this in more detail tomorrow, um, but there's a distributed caching layer built into predictive services. What you can see is, uh, this is the load balancer name, so like all good distributed systems, there's a load balancer to, to make sure we, shed, uh, we share the load um, when we send requests. And you can see what models or predictive objects have been deployed. We didn't want to call them just models because uh, like, like what we did in this example, we defined a function that wraps a model and does a few other things to it, this funny predictor. So this isn't really just a model, this is a predictive object. So that's why we named it that. It's a little confusing. You'll see I use them interchangeably. But you see that I've already got one deployed named funny, and it's at version five, and caching is enabled for it. If you want to see all of the predictive services I have on my machine, the, it's the same as the environments, it's just predictive services. You can see I have a handful of them. All right, so if you guys are following along, and I hope you all are, because this is super exciting, by now, the AWS cluster has probably launched. So you want to add a model because you wouldn't have one in this cluster already. This deployment wouldn't have the, the predictive object um, at all. But in our case, we already have uh, a predictive object named funny, and so I want to update it. So this is a really important piece. So one of the, the powerful things you can do with predictive services is uh, support your, uh, your iterative development or, or iterative deployment scenarios. So you don't want to, uh, you want to update an existing model Say you're training a new model on a nightly basis, you want to update that model um, in production after you've finished your validation testing or after you've uh, gone through your, your testing of that trained model. So we want to do update. So what we've done is we've staged this change. We haven't actually deployed the change yet. And this is important. We're dealing with production here, so we don't want to just randomly start changing production. So we make you go through two steps. This also allows you to stage many model changes at once and then apply them. So when I run this, deployment.apply changes, this is the first time that the model that we trained in this IPython notebook that's on my laptop is getting deployed someplace else. So because we have great Wi-Fi here, um, we're already done. So we took this model that was trained locally and we pushed it to S3. And what you can see is we pushed it to the same, to the, to the path that we defined using that S3 state path. So that took us to, to that path goes to there, and then we put all our predictive objects under it with their version numbers. So you know, you can immediately tell how you get back to a previous version if you want to roll back, roll forward. So you have all the, the model management steps handled for you. Once we uploaded it, we notified each of the nodes in this cluster, in this deployment, that hey, there's a new model, go with zero downtime, roll over and pick up the new model and start serving it. So, now let's query it. We have this model deployed. Now let's go and actually find out if it's any, if, if we send it a review, if it does a decent job of classifying that review as funny or not. So I can get to this deployment uh, just by using that same indexing scheme for the predictive services. So let's do that. You guys should, should get ready. If you look ahead from the audience, I'm going to ask you guys to give me a, a, a review to put in. So let's try a couple examples here. So I'm using a Python client library, but you don't have to use a Python client. We have one built in, but this is just a REST API. So you can use whatever uh, client library you'd like. It's really, really easy to, to, to wrap curl with, uh, um, and curl, there's a lib curl in every programming language. Um, I shouldn't say that, in most programming languages. And, uh, um, and then you can use that really easily to query this REST API. But because we're in Python, I thought I'd show you uh, built, using the built-in Python client library that we have. So we're going to query uh, this funny predictive object. And what this really is doing is querying this REST endpoint with this name. So this is the service endpoint for, uh, for this object. 
with the text of quiche is bad. So what do you guys think? Is this, is this going to be funny or not? Not funny? All right. So we ran it. What you see happens is we connect it to the load balancer, just like we should, and we got back a response. And whoever said that, who sounded half asleep, was right. Oh, you're, oh, okay. You're, oh, okay. You're just talking into your hand. That's all. I see. So you were right. Funny is no. no it doesn't predict that. But it's not super confident in that prediction because the probability is only 52%. Notice something else, guys. We deployed version 5 or version 6, right? You guys paying, a lot, paying attention? But we saw that we got version 5. Well, that's not right, but that's because of caching. So we already had a cached result because I, of course, ran my demo like half an hour ago to make sure it was working before I got on stage. So let's do it again really fast. Aha! So this is, a, this is another important thing that we offer at Predictive Services. We proactively warm the cache. So now I queried again. This time I got my response from the version six, uh, from version six of the model. But you saw it didn't take any time. And that's because when we made the request just a minute ago, the, we returned the stale version five response, but recognized it was stale and went and asked the engine to give us the, the correct answer and, and proactively put that into the cache. So this way, you don't see a latency spike with the uh, hot keys in your cache while, uh, when you do a model update. And we do this for 15 minutes um, every time you do a model update. And then after that, the, the TTL on the keys is, is expired. And then we will go back and get the correct answer from the new model. But this is a way that you don't have to worry about seeing latency spikes. Uh, during uh, when you deploy a new model. So let's try this other one. What do you guys think? Damn, this is good. Funny or not? Funny? Because it got a swear word in it? All right, let's find out. You are correct. This, the classifier believes this is funny. Also cached. Let's try it again. Now we're getting the, uh, uh, the correct answer. It's the same answer because we didn't change the model, but it's the, from the right version. How about this last one? Damn shit. It's kind of fun to say that into a mic. Funny or not? Funny? You are correct. With pretty high probability at 69%. All right, guys, it's your turn. What's the review text? <laughs> it is blank, intentionally blank. This space intentionally left blank. Not funny. I am sorry. The classifier disagrees. How about a couple more? Uh, sure, Amazon reviews would be interesting, but this is a Yelp data set, so restaurant reviews. But it's, say it again, the real what, don't eat quiche? Ah, uh, real programmers don't eat, uh-oh, I got to backspace this, don't eat quiche. Did I get that right? Funny, yes. All right. It's not super confident in that. Um, how about one more? Oh, there we go. I put an exclamation point myself, but didn't help. Still not funny. But this is really, you know, this is a, a sort of a toy example, but you can see the power of how easy it is to integrate your model um, into, into a bigger application because it's just a REST endpoint, and, you, and every application uh, can interact with a REST endpoint. So let's do one from, uh, from curl, just so you guys believe me that I'm not, uh, there, there is no special Python going on here. So I'm making a curl request. It's a post, and then this is the, the payload of the post, the API key that you saw earlier. The, the text is the data uh, JSON object. And then the URL you're going to, this is the load balancer slash data slash funny. So funny is the name that we gave for this, uh, for this endpoint. So the output's not quite as well formatted, but you can see the exact same thing. Damn, this is good is funny. Now, I'm going to end with showing you what the visualization in GraphLab Canvas, which uh, Yu Chang showed you briefly, looks like. And I have to zoom out a little bit. Um, actually, maybe not that far. Um, so what you can see is we have our three node cluster. It's the same information that we saw from the command line, but it's a little nicer to look at. We also uh, s submit metrics to AWS, and you can 
uh, to CloudWatch so you can set up alarms and do all the operational things you'd like to do. That's it, guys. Um, how am I doing on time? Good. Uh-oh, what have I done? Uh, how do I get out of full screen? Oh, I click on this thing. So I've uh, left you guys with a couple links to some more information, but uh, let's go back. Um, I don't have any closing slides. This is the end. Um, so uh, once again, uh, you can come and hear more about deploying models to production uh, tomorrow in the afternoon, and you can hear more about the, the underpinnings of the S-frame that Yu Chang introduced today on Sunday. Um, and Yu Chang and I are around to, to help answer any other questions you guys have and get you unblocked. Hopefully this was a fun uh, tutorial. All right. Thank you.